So uh, I prepared very much for uh, beginning audience, uh, students. It's, uh, hopefully, it's going to be understandable and fairly elementary. Um, uh, because this, this is already advanced for me. That's the reason it's not going to be more advanced uh, and not for any other reason. Uh, so Fabio gave a nice introduction to just the definition of a mixing time and connection to a spectral gap of the Markov chain or Markov kernel, um, both in the relaxation time, which is just inverse of spectral gap, and then the other one, the more standard uh, mixing time, which is in total variation or L1 distance. Um, I'm going to focus on uh, something that's, uh, that's called modified logarithmic sobel of inequality uh, or an entropy constant. It has a couple of different names. And I'll say why modified and what is logarithmic sobel of inequality and uh, what's, what's the difference. Um, so in discrete, uh, on discrete spaces, finite Markov chains and for combinatorial models, uh, it turns out this is, uh, this is a more natural uh, version of the classical log sobel of inequality. And typically these are uh, harder to get estimates on and sometimes the estimates you would like to have on these are just not true. And perhaps for the kind of uh, kinetically constrained models as Fabio alluded, some of the bounds that they have derived for uh, spectral gap and relaxation may not hold for these constants. So I've prepared over uh, you know, these three lectures pretty much uh, everything I know about this modified log sobel of constant and inequality. I won't try to prove everything. I'll prove several things. Uh, but I'll mention some additional references if you happen to like what you'll see. OK? So. Um, I hope to get through at least the first two uh, bullets in the first lecture, and then uh, there's a um, you know, connection to uh, concentration of measure, sub-Gaussian estimates, once you have the so-called modified log sobel inequality. There's some recent work from this year that's quite nice and uh, simple and elegant, at least in formulation. and. Uh, and there's more bullets. I didn't uh, try to put everything here. Um, in particular, there's been some uh, nice, exciting progress in establishing the modified log sobel inequality for a problem that's plagued the community of uh, uh, MCMC people and theoretical computer scientists for uh, 30 years or so. That involves the basis exchange walk of so-called matroids. Okay, so that'll be lecture three. I uh, hope to get to at least describing at a high level how that was achieved. Okay, so let me start with uh, with some basic notation. Um, so omega, as in Fabius lecture, is going to be the state space, and P is what I'm going to use as, uh, you could think of P as a transition probability matrix, because everything is going to be finite space, uh, discrete, and so on. Um, I, in some of the uh, first few slides, I will talk about continuous time. That's uh, although the space is discrete, that's somehow easier sometimes to do calculus with. And this P has uh, Fabio used mu. Uh, it's an unfortunate uh, abuse of the sacred letter pi uh, in the community that pi is now used for the stationary distribution in finite Markov chains. Um, I think Ravi Kanan at some point chastised some of us. Uh, the pi, I think if you're familiar, if you're comfortable with mu, think of uh, pi as mu. Okay. And uh, so Fabio had the script L, and uh, I, uh, at some point I used to use that, but so my uh, capital L is the same as Fabio's script L. Uh, he defined it as P minus I, which is the same here, because I said minus L is I minus P. So it's, it's really the same, uh, this Laplacian. And the inner product, he wrote, uh, right, F with LG, or minus LG, because he had P minus I. So I put the minus here. So this is, this is the same as... So this is what... This I'm going to denote as this from F and F. 
and I'm writing more generally F and G, okay? And then, but for the most part, we're going to use G to be log F, okay? Fabio uses F and F, so rather than writing it twice, he's just introduced. So D for Dirichlet form. And as he said, it's the inner product that's defined this way. And so I'm going to use this notation E and T F, okay? So rather than expectation or variance, this is E and T for entropy, and I'll say why in a second. And formally, this is defined as expectation of F log F minus a term you would like to subtract so that just as with variance, if you had to have variance here, it would have been expectation of F square minus square of expectation so that by Jensen's it's non-negative. So this is also the same thing. This is a convex function rather than F square, I take F log F. And again, by Jensen's inequality, this is going to be non-negative. Okay. And uh, so I might have it on the next slide, but again, why is this called entropy? So if F is density, suppose you have some other measure, mu, and if F is mu over pi, okay, the density of mu with respect to pi, then E pi F is just going to be the measure mu on the whole space, so that's going to be one. Okay, if f is density, e pi f is going to be 1, so this drops out, this will be 0. And this, if you take a moment to reflect, is going to be relative entropy of mu with respect to pi. Okay, for the most part we will be looking at, you know, the distribution of the chain at time t, so f is going to be f sub t, density with respect to pi. And so you could think of, as I'll show in the next slide, entropy of Ft as relative entropy of the chain at time t relative to stationary. Okay, so that's the reason we want to look at this. Of course, you could come up with some other convex functional and then try to understand how your chain approaches equilibrium according to that. So, uh, unaware of some uh, work around the same time, Sergei Bobkov and I introduced uh, this formally but uh, there were works of uh, Italian Dipra, Paganoni Posta, and also a short, nice paper by Gao and Jeremy Costel, uh, which, which certainly dealt with this, and they called it the entropy constant for, for a reason that will become immediate. Uh, but so just as Fabio had a lambda times variance bounded by Dirichlet form, you can consider alpha times this entropy you know, by another Dirichlet form, right? And again, Sandeep will say, why this Dirichlet? Where does this come from? So we'll see in a second. Uh, again, uh, this half, uh, I apologize, you know, there may be a factor of two, as in one half, or two off here and there, so don't hold me completely accountable to some of this. Uh, I'll say why we introduced it with one half, but don't, don't take that as the definition. Later in some slides you might see that I dropped the half. Um, you know, in computer science they introduced this notation O tilde, and tilde hides log factors. And so, you know, I've heard speakers say, what's a log, you know, a log term between friends? But factor two should be not an issue even among enemies, I think. <laughs> That is my lame excuse to not clean up some of the slides. But it's really, unfortunately, in the literature, even the notation, I'm, I, I'm using alpha because of some of the recent paper. But in our paper with Sergey Bobkov, we used rho for log sub 11, rho zero for this modify log sub 11. People use alpha for log sub 11. It's a mess. But I'll try to be consistent at least in these lectures. Okay, so as I said, Relative entropy, which I'm denoting with this, okay, mu with respect to pi is, this is the discrete, uh, this, these are two probability distributions, uh, and discrete space is defined this way. And uh, so, as I said, if F sub t is the density with respect to pi, then d mu t of pi is, is the same as E and t of F t. Okay, so again, E and t of F t is the same as relative entropy. Okay. Now, so what's the point of all these notations, symbols, and so on? So let's look at the so-called you know, heat semigroup or whatever, 
but e to the t l. So you should think, again, remember l was p minus i, so it is like e to the t with p minus i. So you apply that, so this is a time t, you apply that to some initial configuration f0, which could be a point mass at one site, yes? So mu t is the distribution at time t, and that would be something like, you start with mu0 and evolve according to pt. But somehow, you know, I hope you don't get confused between the distribution and the density ft. So, In expectation, right, because Ft is mu t over pi, if I took expectation of Ft, that's going to be 1, right? That's going to be 1 at all times t, e pi of Ft, trivially. We are interested in knowing as t goes to infinity how mu t approaches pi, right? Now you can say in some norm, you can L1, L2, L infinity, or in relative entropy. So if how does mu t approach pi in whatever way you want to measure distance? So suppose we try to measure in relative entropy. This is where it's convenient to use the continuous time evolution the way Fabio mentioned. So think of e to the tl as you know, using the Taylor expansion of e, um, e to the x. So if you do the formal derivation, turns out what you get is actually this Dirichlet form, what you can write as this Dirichlet form. So to me, it's natural in that sense. First of all, you get that, you know, as we've learned in second law of thermodynamics and so on, this entropy, entropy increases. Here it's relative entropy, so it's going to decrease. And so this is, this derivative is something non-positive. But what you get turns out to be this. Now going back to Sandeep's question in the earlier lecture, one way to explain this Poincaré inequality and the Dirichlet form was by min-max characterization of eigenvalue. But if you did this little calculus with relative entropy replaced by variance of Ft, you get EFT Ft, the other Dirichlet form. So then it's natural to cook up some functional inequality and say, well, because the only differential equation I know how to solve is <laughs> the derivative of this is equal to some itself. Right? So we say, well, can I bound this over all f, whether it's the density of this at time t or not? So in the previous slide, we had an inequality that said alpha time to entropy is at most this, so I get this. So this tells us that you have the decay at the rate now. Yes? Okay. So this should be super basic. And we, you know, of course, people did that with variance a long time ago. And again, on continuous spaces, people did this. Um, they knew how to you know. It was natural to look at the entropy decay as well. So let me talk about why modified. Okay, so this is, this is my motivation to study this inequality. Hope at least that much is clear. Because if I can bound that by some universal alpha, that would give me rate of approach to equilibrium in relative entropy. All right, so people also write this Dirichlet form in a different way sometimes, again from continuous, with the continuous usual calculus gradient. Okay, it turns out that's also in, to make sense in discrete, if you introduce gradient of f at a point x, you know, in this way, it should, gradient should be somehow measuring change locally. So the local aspect is here, the probability that I go from x to y. Okay, so a gradient I can define. Um, so you could think of it as this vector, if you like. Right, just for wherever the edges are. These, these edges are present whenever Pxy is positive and so on. Uh, so one remark in a couple of the slides I have, uh, people looked at this in a graph setting. And so in a graph, you have this adjacency based on a graph. And this is really the same, if, especially if you have a reversible Markov chain. So think of pi x, pxy as some weight you give 
to age x, y. If it is reversible, then reversible means for every x, y, pi x, p x, y is the same as pi y, p y x. So the weight is symmetric and so on. So the only difference you have between these two is this factor of whatever the probability kernel is. Okay, so if it's like the discrete cube example Fabio gave, that's you pick one of the n coordinates at random and then in the coordinate with one half, you flip it. Right? So there would be a factor of one over two n or something. All right, um, so in this paper with Bobkov, uh, we try to understand whether, um, you know, what sort of log Sobolev inequalities were natural or interesting. So classically, when you look at entropy of F squared, that is for homogeneous reasons, F squared rather than entropy of F. And the original Dirichlet form, okay, the symmetric one, which is nice to work with, rather than F log F, of log F, you know, in general it's not symmetric, E F log F is not the same as log F F, unless it's reversible and so on. Uh, so th this is nicer in certain uh, respects. So that's the one that's called log Sobolev inequality. And but what was more natural was, as I showed you by taking the derivative of relative entropy, was the EF log F. And so modified log Sobolev was more natural in studying entropy decay on this finite Markov chain. And they're related. So we tried to compile all kinds of variations. Uh, I'm not going to talk about this row one, row two, etc. I just wanted to say for reasons of understanding concentration of measure, especially for Poisson measures, which didn't have like the sub-Gaussian, don't have sub-Gaussian tails and so on, Bobkov and Ledoux introduced some of these variants, and so we tried to sort of understand all these in a discrete framework, and it turned out we could order them. So the one that I'm going to talk about for most of these lectures is this alpha, which is the you could think of it as the entropy constant or MLSI, modified log sub -linear. And so the three that I was, that most of the time people focus on are rho, the log sub -linear, modified log sub -linear, and spectral. Yeah. And just so we could have this without any pesky constants, two or one or four, is the reason we defined with these constants over there. So that's, that's the unfortunate. Uh, reason we have these funny halves and twos and so on, okay? Otherwise, we would have had to write several such inequalities. Okay, but ignore that. Yeah. Excellent. So I may not have a slide in that, but uh, so, yeah, very good. So in terms of uh, finite Markov chains, these usually, the constant is a quote, uh, un, uh, unquote, right? So maybe I have a slide actually in a minute. Let me jump to that and I'll come back to this. Yeah, so here is, uh, okay. Right, so the top one is the spectral gap. The question is, what kind of bounds do they give me for the mixing time? So with the variance we saw, Fabio derived it, it decays like e to the minus lambda times variance at time zero. So you basically what you'll be saying, saving by looking at these bottom two, is the penalty you pay for the initial distribution to come down to something, or initial distance. If you took point mass while the final distribution is uniform on a huge exponential size space, you'll be paying a lot either variance at start or entropy at start. Now, entropy is nicer because entropy is at most log of the size of the state space, right? I mean, for relative entropy, something similar is true. And so to cut e to the minus alpha t times entropy at time zero, it's sufficient to take t to be one over alpha times log log of the initial. So you're saving you're going from a log to log log. That's the same. Which, if it's on, if you're on an exponential size space like the discrete cube two to the n, it saves you a factor of n. Yeah. But yeah, to be that's 
it's a matter of taste if you want to get excited about a saving a factor of n or not, but that's, <laughs> yeah, that's the same. Yes? Sorry, I couldn't hear. Is there a way of characterizing monotonicity? Yeah. Ooh. Yeah, so do I have a, um, I mean, we, in general, we know it goes to zero as you know, if you have a irreducible Markov chain and so on, um, but if we don't have general lower bound, some uniform lower bound, yeah. Um, monotonicity with a question in T, probably. A monotonicity question in T. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that, that's fine. I think, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. You can also do in discrete time, you can actually, um, so you can look at t, so to look at relative entropy at time t plus one, uh, subtract it from relative entropy at time t because at time t is larger, and it's relatable to the again same Dirichlet form. Um, but there's uh, the, Laurent Miklo did that. Um, one has to worry about looking at if p is reversible, then it's easier. Otherwise, you have to look at p times p star multiplicative reversible and things like that. But yeah. And you can also show that, in fact, if you know entropy is decaying at some rate, then that's for all f positive and all t, then that's a lower bound with some rate, say, constant c, then that c is a lower bound on entropy constant, or modified log of that. So it's actually, it captures the rate of decay of relative entropy, exactly. All right. Um, so let me go back for a second. Uh, so this, I have these two slides that talk about, so these are, stand, so people appeal to this. I wanted to show that it's not difficult actually. So I think the row up to you know, some constant two and so on. Uh, there may be a two here and there. So this is MLSI. This is LSI. This is the spectral gap, right? So the, this one is saying this and the first inequality. Okay, why well, there's two, because point-wise you can show, remember that log Sobel inequality compared entropy of F squared with EFF. So whereas this guy had entropy of F, so I took this version, right? Square root of square root F. And so this turns out to be true point-wise. And, and the proof is, you know, it's short, I don't know. Uh, so then maybe let me, since I have it, let me just say. Uh, so this, yeah, well, the one thing that's a little bit annoying in this field, and I'm, you're probably not too shocked, is that there are all kinds of bizarre little one, two variable calculus inequalities. Um, most of the time they're inspired by, I think, something you want to prove. But in this case, you say, with the cautionary word, consider. Consider A times log A minus log B. Right? It's maybe not too bizarre because that's what's in this Dirichlet form. This is just, you can rewrite it in this way, right? This is, there's nothing, just artificially put log A over B and squared it. And now, so everything is equalities, which means it's not complicated. The only inequality is here, where I'm using log C at least one minus one over C. It took me 10 minutes to figure out what, do I believe this as I was looking at my monograph. It's like, but then once I moved log C to the other side, one minus log C at most one over C was easier for me. So one minus X is at most C to minus X. That, that's we used to all the time. Anyway, so this is true. And uh, so that gives you this inequality. And basically the point here is that this is the Dirichlet form with the, with the left hand side and that's the one that you have on the right hand side. So you can write it down and that. Okay, the point is to say these, these are fairly immediate, the comparisons. And I will come back in, in a minute uh, again 
Ganesh might have a question. It's like, okay, you convinced us about entropy might save log versus log log. Then why, why not rho? Why bother with alpha and so on, right? Because both are, in a sense, telling you about entropy. Yeah. Sorry? In the, in the yeah. About ah, yes. This should have been log f minus. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I know. The, yeah. What happened was I had, the version I had was e to the f, f. And I changed f log f not even. Thank you. Yeah, so this is, this should have been log f x minus log f y. All right. The other one, so comparing these two, again, with some factor of two, is, uh, is, is again a standard argument. You will see only maybe the first line, if anything, in, uh, in papers. So I tried to give a little more detail by using Taylor series approximation. So maybe I'll skip over that if people are okay. But this is to say, so we're, what are we saying? We're saying if you had a bound on modify log sub log, that gives you a lower bound on point carry inequality. Okay? That's what we're saying. And so that means we're going to, assuming we have alpha, that says alpha times entropy of f is uh, at most this Dirichlet form. We will apply to certain functions to derive the one that we want for lambda. Basically, if you take f to be of this form, then you end up showing that the Dirichlet form, the point Poincaré inequality follows. Okay, EGG, you can bound in terms of second moment. Okay. We had somewhere we must have assumed mean is zero. Okay. So again, this is not. All right. And uh, so these are the, so there, there was a, like a nice expository paper in 1996 by Percy Diane Cornish and Laurent Sal, of course, that introduced to the community of finite Markov chains this log Sobolev stuff. Uh, from continuous to discrete. Um, so that's actually, it's a, in 2002, I was uh, taking the train from Cambridge to London to meet with Bob Koff. And there was one inequality in the paper by Diaconis and Sal, of course. So they started with d over dt of relative entropy, and they got what I call now the EF log F. And then they went to, they had the log sobel inequality in mind. So they wanted to relate it to E square root half square root half. So they used the inequality that I just showed to prove this. And went, went about. So I said, well, what if we make up some intermediate functional inequality just directly relating entropy to E of log F? And that's how uh, my paper with Bob Cobb came about. So we had two examples I'll mention. For those, it made a difference. So it turned out alpha was better, and it gave the correct mixing time bound compared to rho. And so that, that's sort of interesting. OK, so the, the main point here is log versus log log from these. Okay. So certainly, if these are the same order as lambda, then it, it certainly rho is the best. Oh, one more remark I must make. So here I put only in terms of mixing time, total variation, upper bound, okay? Now, there's also a lower bound on mixing time in terms of one over lambda of p, okay? And hence, one over lambda of p or one over rho of p is also a lower bound on these because the inverse of this goes the other way around in terms of total variation. However, what's nice about log Sobolev rho is in this paper, uh, quite a bit of it is expository, but one of the things that's, that's uh, nice and non-trivial is for tau infinity or tau two. So rather than L1, you measure in the, sometimes people also use chi-square distance, which is a larger distance. So you're able to bound the larger distance by inverse log Sobolev. So one over rho of p up to log log factor actually captures this larger distance. And relative entropy distance, if you like, 
I mean, it's not symmetric, but relative entropy sits between tau 1, which is total variation, and tau 2. So neither lambda nor alpha is good enough to give a lower bound on this larger distance, while rho gives you. Okay? So that's something else that's unique to rho. All right. Oh, so here is another thing. So there's a, an upper bound on, uh, I apologize, this should have been rho, on the log sobolev, okay, on this guy. That's what's done in diaconal cell, of course. That's one over log, one over pi min. By pi min, I mean the smallest entry in the stationary distribution, in case it's not, if it's uniform, then this is nothing but the size of the straight space, one over pi min, okay? So this is one reason you cannot hope for a particularly good lower bound, you know, always while working with rho. Yeah, this, this is an unfortunate type of this, okay, as we'll see in uh, one of the examples. Okay, here is a super basic example, which is, but it turns out it's relevant and important to know. So the complete graph. We had the voter model and the complete graph. <laughs> I started the complete graph. Um, so these are uniformly, the modified log sub and lambda are uniformly bounded uh, by a constant. But log sub is 1 over log n. This is the example of that log of 1 over pi min. Okay. You see, so this is already problematic on the complete graph. Is the reason why in discrete things it's better to work with alpha. And this will play a role in some of the examples I'll mention later, because when you're analyzing a slightly more interesting Markov chain, the value of these constants on the complete graph comes as an ingredient. And you'll repeat it many times, so you'll pay a cost for that. And this, the, these bounds are simply because in that special case, as you saw in Fabio's example of two-point um, you know, this Dirichlet form is nothing but variance. And uh, similarly, if you look at entropy, by definition, entropy of F was expectation of F log F minus expectation of F log EF. That was the definition. So I'm using Janssen's here by concavity of log. So log expectation of F is larger than expectation log F. So this, that's why this is Atmosa. And this is covariance, and covariance is, uh, this g should have been log f. So for the complete graph, with what kernel? So I'm putting equilibrium right away. Because it's the complete graph, I go from x to y with probability that puts stationary. Pxy is just pi of y. Okay, that's the reason that this covariance is actually f comma log f. Rho is unfortunately a bit tedious. It's like a one page. It's in the appendix of Diakonis style, of course, and they say we thank Sergei Bobkov for computing this. So it, <laughs> this is two points. So this is why you know, these log sub modified, they're annoying. But on a two point uh, space, so you have zero and one. But so two things. The measure is asymmetric, not, so let's say P not equal to Q. Q is one minus P. So you go, you stay with some probability, or you jump. It takes this form. And in the P equals Q case, it turns out rho is the same as actually lambda, or you know, two times this equals lambda or something. And the way that's proved is also not super easy. In that case, it's not achieved. So these alpha and rho are in general, they're in phenom. Right? Lambda we know through min-max characterization of eigenvalue, okay, there's an eigenvector in such a, these are in general infimum. But there are theorems that show, there are two theorems, Rothhaus showed for rho and lambda, that if it's not achieved, then in fact it's equal to lambda, two rho or whatever, scaling. And we proved the same for alpha. When infimum is not achieved, in fact, it's equal to. Um, so in the P equals Q case, 
That's one way to show that rho is the same as lambda. But in the general case, it's this. All right. And there's a more general two-state example. Let me skip that because I'm not going to need it. So here is the first non-trivial, not super trivial, no, it's not difficult, example that we worked with and realized this is of some interest. And this is the slice of the discrete cube. So on the discrete cube, on the full cube, it's very easy because two-point case is easy, let's say. Then all these constants, I should have had a slide just mentioning one word, all these constant tensorize, meaning by the inequality Fabio road variance of f on because of the product measure on the full space is at most some expectation of sum of one dimensional variances. The same is true for entropy. If you have a product measure, it's sufficient to compute on one dimension, then you get for free. But when you have a slice of the cube, you cannot quite do that. Right? So this is, you're looking at now the n choose k size. Sorry, I used the French notation here. <laughs> CK is the n choose k. Um, <laughs> um, so the, it's the uniform distribution on n choose k elements of the k slice of the cube. What's the mark of chain? Well, you always have k once and n minus k is zero. So you pick a one uniformly, zero uniformly, and swap them. Okay? So the probability Pxy should be one over k times n minus k, or whatever. Okay? Um, okay, there's a way to, I'm going to go to the next example that's actually more general than this, as it turns out, in a sense. Uh, but my point here is that it's not difficult to do this. Um, and so, yeah, this is. Unfortunately, we forgot to put, the, not forgot, we looked at the graph version, so the 1 over k times n minus k factor is missing. That's why you see uh, uh, for, the, for alpha this quantity. So let me go to the next slide. So the bottom line is for the case life of the n cube, the entropy constant or modified log of a constant has this form. So if k is n over 2, for example, right, like the middle slice, it's order 1 over n. So this is n over 2, n over 3. Okay? But uniformly over all k, you can get some bound like this. Okay, so I want to go through the proof of this one because it illustrates a more general principle that, that's been used in more complicated Markov chain. So both the previous one, so one more thing about the previous one. The reason I mentioned this is that <clears throat> people in matroids call this case slice of the n cube uniform matroid, just some fancy name for that. But whatever bounds people had for this uniform matroid turned out in the recent breakthrough a year or so ago could be proved for the most general matroid and for the corresponding exchange walk on matroid. So that, that was a big surprise. <clears throat> um, and very little was known. I mean, this was known, and there was a class of matroids known as balanced matroid, which um, <clears throat> was a definition that was invented to capture a certain notion of negative correlation in a random basis of matroid. And so for those matroids with that property, nice bounds were known on the mixing time. These constants, but otherwise nothing. But now the whole problem was solved by looking at the entropy decay. First variance decay and then entropy decay. Okay, so this, this has a vast generalization. But the proof for the next one, which is the classical transpositions of cards, uh, has some nice elements that people have used in other proofs. Okay, so that, for that reason, I want to go through this proof. So, the new example, you're on SN, so you have n factorial cards, and the, and the shuffle is what you would do with your three-year-old. Left hand picks a card, right hand picks another card, and swap. Okay? With one over n choose two probability. 
over 1 over n square if you want to take the same. So again, <clears throat> I wrote the symmetric Dirichlet form, but since I want to talk about the entropy decay, I should have had log rather than ff, log f. Uh, but a little notation here. We're going to use sij to indicate the swap, that ith and jth cards are swapped. Okay, so when I have x, which is a particular permutation of the n cards, sij of x means leaves all other in place and swaps the ith and j. Okay, then you can write any of these digital form using this notation R of something comma something. If R A B is A minus B log A minus log B, then that's the Dirichlet form E F log F. If R A B is A minus B square, then that's the one we want for the other two constants. Okay? And this is the N choose two factor as I that I mentioned. Everybody okay with this? And the measure is uniform now. You could take, consider other probability measures, but this is one. So now here is a very nice property that we have for both these Dirichlet forms, EFF and EF log F, convexity. Convexity in this, so A, B, right arrow, Dirichlet, you know, A, my, A, B goes to R, A, B, is what I'm saying is convex. Right, which for either of those are these. By just computing the Hessian, you can check that, okay? And that's useful, as you will see, because now if I have that functional R and averages inside, I can take it outside, okay? This is a very useful property of both while you're working with point Poincare log sub L modified log sub L. And the theorem is it. So the point is that the entropy constant or modified Luxor constant is order, if I were to put alpha here, it's order one over n. One over two times n minus one is what I'm saying. That gives us immediately an upper bound on mixing time of what? So what would this imply in terms of mixing time? I've got to warn you, there'll be quizzes along the way. Here it is. So we go back to the one over alpha. So mixing time bound was plus some dependence on epsilon, etc. right? So this, this was uniform over n factorial. So this guy is, so it will be so this gives you this is n that gives you log n. That gives you n log n mixing, which is tight. Interestingly, rho, this constant the log sub of constant for this example turns out to be 1 over n log n. So it's not quite, if we put it this side, it's not quite n, it's n log n. So it gives you an extra, so plugging it into the same upper bound gives you n log n and an additional. So it gives you n log square n. So it gives you n log square n for, admittedly for the larger tau 2 mixing time, but it, even that is wrong. So there's a seminal paper of Diakonis and Shashahani um, in which they figured out the complete spectrum using group representation of the characters of the symmetric group and so on. So they've figured out all the eigenvalues and so they could estimate the mixing, all these mixing times, not total variation, but the other mixing times and show it's n log n. But this is, as you see, this is of softer proof. We don't know a soft proof of n log n mixing time for the how to for the L2 mixing time, short of figuring out the spectrum, yeah. Because what we are doing gives you only in total variation, 
uh, in relative entropy. One thing I forgot to mention, people might have seen the so-called Pinsker inequality, which is that square of total variation is at most relative entropy. So that's the reason when we are bounding relative entropy, that gives you also bound on total variation, but not on L2, tau2. Okay. Yeah. In this case, the other Sorry, row. Uh, Which row two, row one? I mean that. Ah, yeah. The two and Bob Cobb They also create like one of them. I don't remember. Row one is a little funny sometimes, so I don't remember. Yeah, let me know. <laughs> I don't. I mean, I would have to look at Bob Cobb or do or something because we. I don't think we computed them. Yeah. But do they also give uh, mixed time bound? Uh, not directly. They seem okay. more, yeah. They're more useful for, I think, concentration. Because okay. they're defined using this gradient of f square e to the f, e yeah. to the minus x. Yeah, so. I mean, they're between uh, rho and alpha and lambda. So in a sense, they at least give you a lower bound on lambda. For, re for reversible, they give you a lower bound on point correct constant. So there's, there's oh, yeah. some bound, yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah, they're bigger, yeah. But one of them was useful in uh, absorption concentration type things. Usually the, those are weaker than those in quantity. As you said, the con uh, that's why. Okay. <clears throat> and so the, there are not that many techniques in terms of working with these, and embarrassingly, you know, there were papers of H. T. Uh, you know, I think he did this in the, whenever, in the late 90s, and <coughs> you know, got bored and moved on to other things, and many of the things we since used were actually from the ideas in those papers. The one is L. I. Lee Yao, and then there's this other L. E. E. H. T. Yao, uh, and that uses the convexity of the functional R, along with the chain rule for variance and entropy. Okay, I'll show what I mean by the chain rule. <clears throat> okay, so let's go through this proof sort of quickly. Uh, we, ah, so what's the idea? For both this slice of the cube and the permutations, we're going to use the structure of the space. Sn has this nice structure, right? If I fix a particular card in any position, say in the last position I have like card k or whatever, then the rest of it is like Sn minus 1, right? Any transpositions that don't involve, that don't move this, is like a small. So I could aim to prove this inequality using induction. I want something bigger than one. That's why, by the way, rather than looking at alpha sub n, I move to the right-hand side. This is 1 over alpha sub n. Okay, and we're going to prove Cn at most Cn minus 1 plus some constant, so that gives you that Cn is at most linear in n. Okay? Okay, so far so good, but how do we get induction going? <clears throat> so the two things that work nicely here. Most of the time, you can only do one thing. <laughs> There's a more general theorem that allows you to do one thing, namely, take the space, and that's known as sort of a decomposition theorem. You want to analyze <clears throat> a certain dynamics on your space, partition the space into a bunch of pieces. Here on SN, we're going to partition into N pieces, because whatever position I pick, it could be any one of the N cards in that position. So that naturally gives me N. And the decomposition theorems give you a way of saying either the spectral gap or these log sub type constants on the full space can be bounded from below in terms of two other corresponding constants. One is on the so-called restrictions uh, chain. So if you restrict to each of the pieces in your partition, you can say, how well am I mixing in, the, in that piece? Okay. If 
all the pieces, namely minimum over the n pieces or however many pieces have of the spectral gap or MLSI can be bounded from below, meaning every one of them is mixing well, then you should do well. But there's another one that's called the projection chain. So coalesce each of the pieces into one point. If you have n pieces, then you have n points. You should be able to mix well among the pieces, right? See, what could be a bottleneck for mixing on the full space in this view of the world? So you have This is up to you how you want to split. So these are the restriction chains. This is the full omega. So this is a disjoint union. So inside these moves are the, but you also have such moves, right, that go You could be mixing really well in each of those, but if you don't hop from one piece to the other, you're not going to mix them. So the projection chain takes each of the omegas into a, right? Typically, if every pair commutes, then you have like a complete graph here, okay? And you find ways of saying what the transition should be here based on how much they interact. So if your functional constant on the projection and each of these do well, then you want to say the original chain mix as well. That's the spirit of it. And it could be done really nicely, perfectly on SN. Um, what works nicely and gives you the n log n bound, as I said, there are two things you can do. One is this idea, but on SN, on, and also the case slice of the n cube, I can do it n times. It turns out averaging over those n times gives you the good constant. Otherwise, you get like n square log, and you, you lose a factor. What do I mean I can do this n times? So Sn, if I say in position n, I can fix a particular card, any of the n cards, that gives me, based on which card, n pieces. But I can also go over the position. Why the nth position? I could fix the n minus first. So I have two degrees of freedom. So it turns out if you do both, then you get the, this was the, this was the nice idea to bound rho, the original log sub log constant in the paper by Lee and Yao. But they got the n log n, right? Which doesn't give the good mixing time. But the same procedure works for these other ones. So, to implement that, we say, okay, you, for each t, partition s, k, t. Now, in the t-th position, I have card k. But then, so, later on, I'm going to go through both t and k as they go through 1 through n. Okay, right now, it's k goes 1 through n, t is fixed. So, that's one partition. Now, the measure restricted to that piece is just 1 over n minus 1 factor, because I'm not going to move that card from that position. So that says 1 over n minus 1. And on the projection, what measure do I put? Well, each of these has n minus 1 factorial, which is 1 over n of the whole. Right? So this will be 1 over n, 1 over n. So it's like complete graph with uniform on the other one. Okay? So that's mu t mu with superscript. And here is the standard, what I call chain row. Whether it's entropy or variance, we have this nice identity, right? This is average of the entropies, and this is entropy of the average. Right? For variance, you have the same. So these are for the restriction phase. So this entropy, I'm going to restrict f to the kth piece, okay? So that's why it's F indicator is restricted to this class. And this is for the projection. So when I want to understand dynamics on this, you give me any F, I average it over that piece, and I put F bar of I there. I'm going to run out of time. <laughs> so let me just 
finish this idea and then I'll stop. <clears throat> so this methodology, which works quite nicely for several examples, the idea is I can bound each of these entropies using induction hypothesis, because this is now on Sn minus 1. Cn minus 1 times the corresponding Dirichlet form. The annoying thing in more interesting chains is how to bound this one. See, this is entropy of something. In principle, you can bound it by any Dirichlet form you want in the world, because entropy doesn't give you any restriction. This is, right, this is about just the measure. There's no dynamics P, X, Y involved. However, if you just put whatever <laughs> Dirichlet form on the right with the corresponding good constant, you want to be able to relate it to the original Dirichlet form. That's where you will pay some penalty. In this example, we won't pay a penalty because of that convexity. You see, I reminded you this R functional is convex. So you have F bars with the average inside, but you can pull the average outside. And that gives you an easy way to relate to the original Dirichlet form. That's, that's what's nice about this particular example and some, some other ones like that. Okay, so basically the idea is I have this, but then as I said, I can do it one more time because I can go over T. Why, the, why fix only the last card? I can fix any of the positions. That gives me n times on the left. When I do that, I really pick up the entire Dirichlet form. So I save something in this averaging. So I'll, uh, this is the, now some algebra, okay? By, as I said, the restriction inside each piece lets you do induction, get Cn minus one. And for the projection, I have this on F bars, and now I use convexity and I take the summation that's in these bars outside, okay? So this is the convexity. I have these sums, these averages inside, I pull them out. So in the end, I put the two, one is coming from all these restriction chains, the other one from projection, I put the two Dirichlet forms together, I get what I want and gives me nicely, okay? Hope it's sort of clear except for the algebra. So it's a, it, this, take, this tool has been useful except when you know, an, an encounter this being used in some of papers with Fabio and several others, what you need to immediately focus on in the, is a projection term, whether it's variance of entropy. That's where the interesting, because the other one is by induction hypothesis, easy. Okay, let me stop. So in the next <clears throat> lecture, I will uh, talk about a slightly more decomposition result. So if you have an abstract partition like that, what can you say? And there's a nice, we did it for log Sobolev and spectral gap in some ad hoc way with Mark Jerram and Eric Vigoda and so on several years ago. And this year, there's a nice paper by Jonathan Herman and uh, Justin Sales, uh, which did uniformly for all three in a nice way. This was the proof I was begging for and asking people for many years, because somehow we could do for the two extremes, like the rho and lambda, which means there should be something for the one in the middle, but we didn't see a clean enough way. But now there's a very simple, clean way to write this decomposition for all three, just using the convexity of that R functional. Okay. And yeah, so I will talk about that, and then uh, modified log subular inequality implies sub Gaussian uh, concentration of measure. So I'll talk about that. <laughs>